Amen, amen. Well, again, welcome to Night of Worship. And as we have done all year, we're looking at the central theme of what's in a name. What's in a name? And we're looking at specifically the names of God. And last month, Pastor Keith preached on Jehovah Shalom. God is peace. And tonight, we're going to look at another name for God, which is Jehovah Jireh. God provides. God is our provider. God will provide. God is our provider. And the only time in Scripture that, believe it or not, that name of God is used comes way back in the book of Genesis, specifically Genesis 22, when Abraham declares those words, Jehovah Jireh. So tonight, what I want to do is I want to look back at that, that beautiful story in the book of Genesis, Genesis 22, verses 1 through 14. That'll be our anchor text for tonight. And I'm going to spend some time really reading through the text. And then what we'll do is we're going to unpack the text and really look at kind of four lessons learned, four lessons learned that we can apply in our lives to better understand the idea that God is our provider. So if you want to open up your Bibles or your Bible apps, you can see um, in Genesis 22, beginning in verse 1, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son, Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. And that's Abraham's story, and that's the genesis of the title of God, Jehovah Jireh. And so for Abraham, he had a Jehovah Jireh moment, didn't he? A Jehovah Jireh moment when God provided the ram in place of his son Isaac. And so when Abraham utters those words, Jehovah Jireh, he's not just saying God gives us. God gives me things. He's actually declaring something. He's saying this, the deep meaning of Jehovah Jireh is this, that God cares, God sees, and God does something about it. He provides for the need. So it's a deeper meaning than just God gives us. Also, it's deeply personal, it's deeply loving, and it's deeply moving. Because Jehovah Jireh is not just about God did provide but what does it say, church? It says, God will provide. So it's not just a past memorial, but it's a future action. It's a confidence that no matter where we're at in life, God will provide. And so when you think about your life and you look at Abraham's story, 
When was your Jehovah Jireh moment? Have you had a Jehovah Jireh moment in your life? As some of you are young still, you're very young, but maybe even at a young age, you've had a moment, a moment in your life when you were desperate, when you were searching, when you were seeking, you would run out of all of your own strength and you said, God, help me. And God provided for you. In my life, I would say I probably had several Jehovah Jireh moments where God has revealed himself to me and reminded me that he is my provider. Most recently, perhaps one of those, the, the most powerful Jehovah Jireh moments in my life was when I experienced a, a season, uh, it was an, a 24-hour period where our son, Jake, our second-born son, um, was lost in the Ventana wilderness. So he had gone out for a hike and he didn't come back. And so for a period of about 12 hours, from about 8 o'clock at night until 8 o'clock the next morning, we were out searching for him, desperately looking for our son. And from hiking up the mountains and searching all the different areas, finally about noon on the following day, no sign of Jake, no trace. And what they say typically when it comes to these lost in the wilderness situations, when you hit that 24-hour mark, which is where we at, at that noon mark, that the chance of survival goes way down. And so I was up on top of the mountain, and I was there with a good friend of ours, Sam Mazza, who brought his truck up there. And Sam and I and our youngest son, who had gone out with me to search for Jake, and many of you were back here at Shoreline, were praying for Jake. And I got to a point where I had to just get out of the truck. And I walked out on these roads. And as only a father can do looking for his lost son, as a mother do for her lost child, any parent would do for their child, I walked up and down those roads. And I yelled, Jacob, Jacob. And after about an hour of that, I found this stump underneath the tree. And I went over this stump. And I just sat down on the stump. And this is what I said to God. God, either way, my son Jake is with you. Whether he's alive or whether he's deceased, he's with you. And I just felt a sense of peace. So I walked back over to the truck. And I got into the truck. And Sam was there and my son was in the back. And I got into the truck. I picked up my phone. And I looked at my phone and I said, I can't believe. I said, there's a voice message. Somehow signal there's a voice message on my phone. And for a moment, I didn't want to listen to the voice message. I didn't want to hear what was on the other end. But I did. I pushed play. I want you to listen to the voice message. Just the actual voice message I received. Hey, Sean, this is Jesse with the Sheriff's Office, and I just want to try to get a hold of you. Uh, we have Jake. Jake was on the side of a mountain. We just picked him up with a helicopter, and he's at Lucia Lodge. Uh, if you could pass it around. Thanks. Bye. That, I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Folks, that was a Jeho Jehovah Jireh moment for me. Because Sam and I and my son, we were screaming and yelling and everything in the car. As calm as that deputy sheriff was, we were the complete opposite. That was a Jehovah Jireh moment. For me, God had provided. God had mercifully spared our son. And so for me, that is a beautiful reminder that God, just as the same God that provided Abraham, provided for me, provided for our family, provided for our son. And so as we unpack this text, we look back on this text, I want to look at really four big lessons that we can learn from Abraham. The first one of those lessons is that God can call us to give up what we love most. God can call us to give up what we love most. In verse 2, if you remember, it says, Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Now just, we pause there. God had given Isaac to Sarah and Abraham. She was 90, he was 100. And Isaac was the promised son who would be the one that will fulfill the promise that God had told Abraham that he would be many descendants 
He would have, be the, the, the father of many nations. He would be a blessing to many nations. And ultimately, we know that Jesus himself comes out of the line of Abraham. This beautiful, beautiful reminder. And yet here God's saying, take your one and only son and sacrifice him. And now some people may hear that. And this passage right here can cause a lot of angst, a lot of concern, because it runs, we hear, did God, is he condoning human sacrifice? Is God condoning specifically child sacrifice? But we know God's character. We know that God will never counter his word. He will never contradict his word. And although that in pagan cultures and many of the cultures at that time around that surrounded Abraham, this would have been acceptable practice, the answer is no. God strongly opposed this practice. We can read in God's word, Leviticus 18.21, it says, Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Deuteronomy 12, 31, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way. He's talking about worshiping God in the way of these other nations, of these other tribes. Because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. God abhorred, God opposed. So the question is, why did God command Abraham to sacrifice his son? And why would Abraham follow God's command? Well, what we can do is we can turn to Scripture to help us understand that better. Listen to Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. It says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. And even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So why did God command him to sacrifice his son? I think it boils down to two words, test and trust. This was a test of trust for Abraham. You see, earlier in Genesis 17, God had told Abraham that if you are faithful and if you walk blamelessly, then you will inherit the promises of the covenant. And this was the ultimate test. This was the test of his faithfulness. Would he be obedient to God? And then how could Abraham willingly follow God's command? Well, these verses from Hebrews also tell us that Abraham knew God's character so well, knew God's power, that Abraham believed and he trusted that even if God took Isaac at that moment, that God could raise him. He had the power to raise him from the dead to fulfill the promises that God had already declared for Abraham. And so like, like Abraham, the reality, folks, is that God can call us, any one of us, to give up what we love most. Now, why would God do that? Well, maybe it's like Abraham. God might ask us to give up something we love because he's testing us. He's refining us for something better, something greater. Maybe it's even sometimes God will ask us to give something up that we love to redirect us. Maybe we're on the wrong path and God wants to redirect us. And then also sometimes it might be to repurpose us. Like with Abraham, he was Abram. And God repurposed him, gave him a new mission, gave him a promise, and gave him a new name. So God does so. He does it out of love for us. See, he created us. He knows what's best for us. And he deeply cares for us. And so ultimately, when God asks us to give something up, we can trust God that it's for our good and his glory. Amen? And so the question for us tonight is, is God calling you to give something up maybe that you love? Something that's in your life. I don't know, maybe it's a, maybe your current career and you feel that God's calling you into a new career. And so you're, you're saying, is that what God's calling? And maybe it's, maybe it's a relationship or a lifestyle. And God's saying, hey, I want what's best for you. So I'm calling you out of that. And so my encouragement to you tonight would be maybe at the end of service, we'll have our prayer teams up here. You could come up and, and ask people to pray for you. They'd love to pray for you, to help you seek wisdom and counsel in that. So is God calling you to give up something you love to fulfill a greater purpose? 
I think the second lesson we can learn from Abraham is this. Our part is to take the next step and be faithful. Take the next step and be faithful. We look at Abraham when he was commanded by God to go and sacrifice his son. The next verse says, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. Do you notice the sense of urgency? Abraham said, God commanded, I'm going to move out and do it. Even though the task was daunting and overwhelming. I can't even imagine what Abraham was thinking. Also, the work. Notice that Abraham, in, in that verse, it says that he went out and he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering. God expects us, when he commands us, to do the work, to partner with him in the process. And then the third part of that was worship. Notice what Abraham said. He, said, he got there and he said, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there and we will worship and then we will come back to you. See, Abraham saw this offering of Isaac as an opportunity, as an act of worship. This is the first time in the Bible where we we see worship, that word worship. Abraham saw it as an opportunity to worship God. And then finally, those words, we will come back to you. Abraham went with Isaac with hope. With hope, expecting God to provide So we have to ask ourselves, is God calling us to take a step of faith somewhere in our life? Somewhere in our life, is God calling us to take a step of faith? And what are we doing about that? Are we in the same sense of urgency to respond to God as he calls us into that, to take that step of faith? We have to come up with a plan, and then we have to do it. Now, I don't know what that step of faith is for you, but if you ask God, I'm confident he will lay it on your heart. I think our third lesson from Abraham is this. We have to take hold of teachable moments with confident faith and trust God with the outcome. So it's take hold, take hold of those teachable moments that God brings into our life. And then we have to trust God. So it's take hold and it's trust God. And that's what Abraham did. I love that, those verses in uh, verses 7 through 8, when it says, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? See, contrary to what most people think, Abraham wasn't, excuse me, Isaac wasn't a young child here. Most biblical scholars believe he was probably in the late, te- late 20s, somewhere in the 30s. He was a young man, specifically could have been of military age. So he was smart enough. He figured something, something's not right here, something's going on. And then Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. There's that hope again. See, Abraham fully trusted God to provide what was needed. He fully trusted. And Isaac, he trusted his father by willingly submitting to his father's leadership. Willingly submitted. That is that taking hold of a teachable moment. Now, how about you? What what are some areas in your life where you find yourself in those teachable moments? And are you like me when those teachable moments come? Instead of taking hold, you're doing this. Maybe it's the flat tire that suddenly you got when you show up, you go out to work and you look in the parking lot, oh, I got a flat tire. And in those moments, how do you respond? That's a teachable moment, right? And for those of you that are parents with little ones, guess who's watching you? Those are teachable moments, amen? So this teachable moment, to take hold of those teachable moments. And then our fourth lesson is that, that the great Jehovah Jireh comes from is that we're called to memorialize and remember the times that God shows up and provides. Memorialize and remember those times when God shows up. In verse 13 to 14, it says, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son and that's when Abraham declared, that Lord will provide. Can you imagine? I mean, I just experienced the joy that I had, the elation that I had when I got that voice message. Imagine Abraham, the Lord provided. Isaac doesn't have to be sacrificed. This is a clear way to mark and memorialize those moments. Abraham did it here. His declaration that God will provide. Now, why do you think Abraham did that? And why should we do that? Oh, how easy we forget, do we not? We forget so often how the Lord provides in remarkable ways. 
that when the time comes, maybe later on, and we get anxious about something, and we forget to look back and see what the Lord has done. And so Abraham wanted to make sure that not only he, but Isaac and all generations to follow would never forget that God will provide. Amen? And so for us, I think it's important that we do an inventory. We're, we need to do an inventory daily of God's provisions. And so the question for us tonight is, how has God provided for you in your life? From the, those moments of Jehovah Jireh to the simple things in life, God is our provider. So maybe it's people who love you and who you love. Think of those people in your life who love you, who care about you, and those people that you love and love you. God provided. How about material things? Oh, yes. Sometimes it's just enough, and sometimes it's extra, right? Whether it's that car, whether it's a truck, whatever it might be, we are so blessed it's God that provides that to us. How about opportunities and experiences? We've all got those. Now, some of those opportunities and experiences we'd like to forget, but a lot of those opportunities and experiences will help shape us as Christ followers today and help change the way we live our life. How about protection? Oh, how God loves to protect us. Anybody ever been at a, a light, your traffic light, and the green light changes, and you're like... Something inside of you just says, hold on a second, and you begin to go forward, and all of a sudden, shoo, there goes that car zipping through. I believe God's protecting us all the time in those moments. God provides protection, and God provides spiritual blessings. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you know that ultimately Jesus Christ provided. He was the lamb who was slain for our sins, and when we place our faith in Jesus, we inherit every spiritual blessing in the eternal realms. And, of course, there's so much more. And so the question for each one of us is, how are we memorializing those Jehovah Jireh moments in our life? How are we doing that? Maybe it's personal memorials. For me, um, if you come into my office, you'll see a picture. Uh, I keep a picture in my office, and I'll put it up on the screen there. And uh, this picture you'll see on the screen there, this is the first time after coming down from the mountain that I had the chance to hug my son, Jake. And I keep this in my office to remind me of how God provided for me that day, how God provided for Jake, how God provided for our family. I never want to forget how God provided. And also personal testimonials. There's memorials and testimonials. So how are you sharing those stories when God provides for you in miraculous ways? And so what I thought it would be helpful tonight to do, um, you've heard me talk about my son. You've heard me talk. What I'd like to do is I'd actually like to invite him up so you can hear his perspective. And just as God provided for me, and just as God provided for Abraham, I'd love for you to hear how God provided for Jake while Jake was lost in the wilderness. So Jake, will you want to come on up here? And I'm just going to pull a stool up here. Here it is over here. Um, And when you see how tall Jake is, now you know why I'm going to have a stool. He obviously gets his height from his dad, right? Um, so, Jake, um, thank you so much for volunteering tonight to come and share. Um, can you just give us a kind of a, a flyover of what happened that day and how you ended up, not lost, but misoriented is what the military said, misoriented in the wilderness. How much time do I have? Well, fly over, you said. There you go, fly over. That's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I need to set the table probably with the fact that I'm not really the biggest outdoorsman. Uh, I love to hike, I love to work out, but generally the hikes that I go on, I kind of do them as fast as I can and then I go back to the car. So I tell this story a lot and I get a lot of funny looks like, wait, you were wearing what and you brought what with you? You were not prepared. Um, so I just want to set the table with that. But I was doing the last hike of a county challenge. I worked for the county, and they issued this challenge, and there was one way down in Lucia, uh, in, in the Ventana Wilderness. Mm -hmm. It was about a two-hour drive. So I, I got up in the morning, went through my normal routine, drove down there to do the hike, and was told that the trail was closed up to Cone Peak. 
So it's supposed to be about a four mile hike, uh, but the person that told me that the trail was closed, no problem, you can drive back down to highway one and you can hike up from there. And it's about seven miles, he told me. So I'm thinking, okay, that's okay. I, I should be fine to do that. Went through the hike, went a long ways, a good seven miles, and essentially took one wrong turn, one wrong turn uh, yeah. off the trail. And again, kind of got misoriented, was still trying to make my way to Cone Peak. And then pretty quickly ran out of the little bit of water that I brought, uh, the little bit of energy that I still had left, and decided, well, I'm going to go ahead and follow this stream down to Highway 1, because it's going to empty into the Pacific, right? I, I thought I was really smart, even though everyone says, don't go off the trail. And I knew that. I figured I would try it, because I was like, I can't go back at this point. I don't have seven miles left in me. I think it was upper 80s, lower 90s, so I was pretty hot and out of water. And so I proceeded down this river, and for the most part, it was pretty gradual, nice walk in the river. I slipped a few times, and then I hit um, Lime Kiln Falls, which was about a 100-foot waterfall. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was actually stuck essentially between two waterfalls, and it was about 8 o'clock at night at that point. And so I, I turned back around and said, well, I'm going to climb this wall up and out. And uh, I, I got maybe 10, 15 feet up and slipped down the face of the rock mm -hmm. and fell. And then I said, okay, well, I guess I'm sleeping here tonight because I can't see anymore either. And uh, so I, I bedded down for the night. And um, the next morning, I had to climb that same wall to get up to an elevation where I could try to get higher. I was hearing the helicopter. Yeah. And I knew that I needed to get higher for the helicopter to see me. And, and long story, slightly shorter than long, I guess, uh, the helicopter ended up dropping uh, a, a sheriff deputy down mm -hmm. to strap me in and, and lift me out from... Uh, the peak that I had climbed to where they were able to yeah. see me. Yeah, and miraculously, no injuries, uh, you know, just a little bit of dehydration, and um, from sleeping out in the woods, you got a little bit of poison oak, and but not not bad, so... Um, it, it turned into a lot of poison oak. Yeah. If anyone's ever had poison oak, uh, it looks like a little bit, and then all of a sudden, yeah. it just is popping yeah. up everywhere. So, yeah. yeah. Now, Jake, obviously, tonight, we're talking about Jehovah Jireh, and um, we're talking about God as our provider. Can you just give a couple of examples um, of ways that God provided for you in, in very real and tangible ways while you're out there? Yeah, I mean, this is a long list again, but I'll try to give a few. Uh, first of all, like I said, I, I don't do long hikes. I'm not a backpacker, but my wife did force me to take a little breakfast bar with me and a bottle of water, uh, and, and that would prove to be very valuable. Uh, so that's one. Uh, number two ended up to be, I think, another rule that you're not supposed to break is don't drink the water but when I got to that stream and I was completely out of water and I had my bottle, at some point I made kind of a, a calculated risk to drink the water because mm -hmm. I, I knew I wouldn't make it very long. And, and that turned out to be healthy, pure water. Fortunately, no, no, uh, nothing mm -hmm. bad from that. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I would say really God's presence the whole time. Yeah. It's interesting because the last person that I saw was at about noon on Saturday, just kind of passing by on the trail. So from about noon to noon the next day, I didn't see any humans, which, you know, I, I work and I'm a dad, I have three mm -hmm. kids, so that's very rare for me to not see anybody. But I felt the whole time like I was walking with him and I, and I was at peace and I was comfortable. I wasn't really scared, uh, at least until I got to the, the 100 foot waterfall and was yeah. trapped. Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely another one. The whole church family that was praying for me, uh, I definitely believe in the power of prayer. And I could feel that. I feel like that energized me, you know, me talking to God, the church praying for me, people from the church and my own family out looking for me. So really, they're endless. Uh, I would say the next morning, having the strength to be able to really climb up the face of the rock until yeah. kind of the point of no return. I shouldn't have had that level of energy or strength at that point with eating just one breakfast bar in 24 hours. Yeah. And definitely the, the first responders, and uh, it was actually two trail runners that saw me from way across yeah, the canyon. I yeah. didn't think they were going to be able to hear me, but I just yelled at the top of my lungs because as I was climbing up, the helicopter wasn't seeing me. It just kept passing by, passing by. I'm waving, trying to glare my phone at them, <laughs> and it wasn't successful. But So they actually ran back down and pointed the amen. helicopter in my direction. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot more, but yeah, that's amen. a few, I yeah. guess. And I know, Jake, for you... Um, just as Abraham, we talked about lessons learned. What are two big lessons that you learned out of this really help grow your faith um, and help uh, strengthen your faith? I would say that life is short 
and God is in control and he provides. Mm -hmm. Life is short, really in terms of, I started to kind of realize coming out of, I guess, a near-death experience that there's a lot of things that I'm concerned about on a daily basis that don't really matter that much. And so I've started to try to have more of an eternal uh, mindset and perspective and and using that to share Christ more, whether it's on social media, Mm -hmm. whether it's in person. The story itself has definitely provided me the opportunity to share about Christ more because I firmly believe that, like I said, he was with me, he protected me, he provided for me. So that's the first and uh, I guess God being in control and providing if that's not Mm -hmm. already apparent. Uh, For me, it applies beyond just the hike, whether I'm lost in the wilderness, whether I'm facing possible job loss, whether I'm going through a almost two year global pandemic, God is in control and he will provide. And I think that's like the application that I would uh, apply it to for anybody that whatever you're going through, God is there. He will provide, uh, call out to him, trust in him and be willing to move your feet and maybe climb a little bit too if, if he calls you to do that. <laughs> amen, amen. Well, Jake, thanks for sharing your story. Um, can we give Jake a, a hand here? Thank you, Jake. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, uh, great provider, sustainer, Jehovah Jireh. Lord, we thank you that you are so good and that you provided for us. And just as you provided for Abraham, Lord, you continue to provide for us today. And so, Jesus, now as we come to your table, we pray for your presence with us. And, Lord, we thank you again that you are our great provider, the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. Amen. Amen. They were having a meal together, and they'd shared hundreds of meals together in the past three years. But as they laid around this table, reclined around this table as they did in those days, they must have known, they did know, something's different about this meal. Already there had been a different atmosphere, a different tone, and he'd been telling them for days, even weeks, maybe months, that the Son of Man has to die. That the walls of this temple are going to come down, they're going to be rebuilt in three days, and yet they don't really understand what this means. And, and so certain things that had never happened before are happening at this meal. And at one point, he gets them to share bread. And he gets them to pass this cup around. And they're, they're thinking, what's this about? What, what, what? This is different. What's happening? Because he knows what they don't know. He knows within hours, it's all going to happen. All of the events and prophecies of history are going to be tied together in the next few hours as he pays the price that the Lord promised from Genesis 3 on. They don't know that. They don't know that. They're going, something's different. And then he passed around the bread and the cup and they had the very first communion. I'm going to share that here tonight. We're going to enter into a time of communion that can really, in a way, take us back to that very moment. And relive that with him and remember that. It's an ancient practice now. Because when he did that, he said, what we're going to share in a moment about the bread and the wine. He said, and continue to do this. Do this going forward. And the church has been doing it ever since. It's a special time when we come together as one, of one mind, to remember the gift of grace that is represented in this sacrament that we do by the breaking of bread and the cup and to honor the sacrifice Jesus made solely out of his great love for his children. Pastor Sean has unpacked for us beautifully this concept of Jehovah Jireh, God provides. And in seasons of uncertainty and a climate of chaos and confusion, Jake mentioned that, not only in his past, but the things that we're going through now. God, our provider, grants us clarity, and he gives us the confidence that we can carry on. So when Christ died for our sins, it was God's grand provision for our present. When Jesus rose from the grave and ascended to heaven, he provided for our future. As we come together and experience this one with another, we're celebrating both present and future together. 
But this is a personal faith in Christ that we take. And this places us in the midst of God's favor. And so when we consider his provision and we reflect on that here as we come to the table here, We should come to this, there's a solemnness to it, but there's also this grand celebration. Uh, Sean, thanks for sharing that picture of your hug with Jake. Uh, uh, this is uh, an opportunity to, to celebrate in this bread and this cup and be in the embrace of your Lord and Savior. Let's savor that. So, Paul wrote some very special words in the book of 1 Corinthians, and he describes the ceremony of communion. The only reason he did that is because the tradition had been carried down year after year, faithfully, for many, many years, as it is to this very day. And he wrote these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, much like this. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is, a, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And then the Apostle Paul wrote these words. He says, whenever you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if you're watching online, please get your elements ready. And those of you in the seats, you have a cup. It has two wrappers. The first wrapper, if you pull it back, exposes the wafer. The second wrapper exposes the juice. And if you're a believer, this is for you. You get the depth and the richness of this communion together. If you're not a believer yet and you're here tonight, we are so glad that you're here. Just enjoy this time. But it isn't for you. But at some point, if you choose to turn your face to Jesus and receive his grace and salvation through him, you'll then reap all the meaning that this can possibly have. So as we prepare to take this together, one with another in community here, but also very personal in our embrace of this, there are several things that we want to have in mind here. First, we want to remember Jesus. The power and provision of his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his presence to examine our own hearts and specifically the Bible says if you're holding something against your brother we're to let the spirit wash that away even if you find sin in your heart confess that and then confess your need for him because truly we need him each day every day all day and then we're celebrating together in community even though this is an individual uh, contemplation and act that we do we're still doing this as his children gathered together brothers and sisters celebrating that corporate community his love for us collectively and individually and then it's a grand reminder of Jehovah Jireh God provides when we take this bread this bread represents his body. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Bread was everything in those times. It was made from the first harvest of barley. It was life. It was rich. It was nutritious. And it represented Jesus. And he knew that. And he said, when you break this bread, this is my body given for you. Break this in remembrance of me. Take your bread now and join me.
cup represents the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I would encourage you to take that cup and just peer in for a moment and give thanks. And then in somber celebration, let us take the cup together. Father God, great provider, We ask that you would rain down blessings upon us as we ponder your incredible, unfathomable gift of your son. As we've broken bread, as we've shared a cup, as we've celebrated your grand provision, rejoicing hearts, grateful hearts, hearts filled with thanksgiving. We celebrate one with another and we celebrate with you. Your grand provision, your wonderful protection. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.